God bless you as you join us today on YouTube. So I'm reading from Matthew 6, 1 to 14. Watch out. Don't do your deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. And when you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they've received all the reward that they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. And give your gifts in private, and your Father will, who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that that is all the reward that they will get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door be behind you. Pray to your Father in private. And then your Father who sees everything will reward you. And when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. But pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't lead us, or don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. Let us pray. Father God, just place me behind the cross. You always in the forefront. And we just pray that you will let your words ring true into our ears and down into our hearts, Lord God. We give this service to you, for it is all about you. For we serve you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Legalism is a killer. This is a difficult sermon, and I place myself in the middle of this as well. Change can be difficult. As fickle humans, we don't like change. I remember hearing my mother say, when she became a senior, she said, this is gonna happen to you someday. You will not like change. You are going to hate it. A part of that is true. Sometimes when I see the week ahead of me and the schedule getting changed or I have an appointment or whatever may come my way, a little bit of anxiety might hit me and it makes me feel a little uneasy. Welcome to seniorhood, Chris. It used to be like that for me in church too. I didn't always like the new music. I didn't like the way Sunday morning church of order was changed. But then I had to realize it wasn't about me. So my new mantra is, go with God or get out of the way. When he moves, when things change that we don't like, we can, with our stubborn attitude, squelch what he's got planned for us. And then we fall into that big stagnant pool trapped in the mire and the muck. And then we wonder why we're not reaching people. Is it because, and I ask myself this question, is it because we want it our way? Or is it that it's all about ourselves? And so I had to place myself in that big picture. Do I want to follow the leading of the spirit or do I want to stay put? Because I don't want to be left behind. Author R.J. Thessman says this about legalism in the church. He says, during the turbulent 1960s, the Billy Graham evangelistic team settled into our small town and then they produced this film and then they wanted to train all the counselors for the gospel invitation at the end. So he said, as a high school student, I signed up hoping to reach some of the teens in my town. Well, the training was over a period of several weeks. It was intense. And then how do you lead someone to Christ? 
Do you know how to give them the resources that they need? So we practice the role playing. We received critiques from our supervisors and they eagerly looked forward to the premiere showing of the restless ones. Name of the movie, I guess. The end of that week, I made some new friends. I led several teens to Christ. I helped another teen find a church to join, work side by side with the members of the Graham Association. Yet when I showed up for the youth meeting in my church, one of my friends confronted me. How could you do that, she said. Don't you know you've ruined your Christian witness? She was upset because in my church, a conservative fundamental denomination, going to the movies was a sin. No matter what the motivation, we were never going to go inside a movie theater. The reasoning? Well, movie theaters were dark. And who knows what kinds of immoral behavior happened in the dark. Other prominent sins of our church, they said, were boys and girls could never swim together, even at church camp, because they might touch each other under the water. Absolutely no form of alcohol or tobacco. Girls wore no makeup because the Bible said that we were supposed to have the inner beauty of a gentle heart. Never ever date anyone who was not a Christian. If you married an unbeliever, you could never escape the marriage, no matter what kind of abuse you suffered. These were just a few rules of Legalism 101 in their church, they said. And although I love the people who attended, I can now attribute several lies perpetrated by this legalistic attitude and the strongholds of baggage that they caused. Everything was based on how good we should be to earn God's acceptance. So it's taken years of therapy to realize God really does love me, no matter what I do. The additional danger of legalism is that for every rule that we're taught, a Bible verse was connected to it. And the leaders of their church knew how to create a doctrine for every single bit of law. It was a form of spiritual abuse, all the more dangerous because it set us apart from others and kept us from building relationships with sinners. And according to the Webster Dictionary, the de definition of legalism is strict, literal, excessive conformity to the law or to a religious or moral code. So I got thinking, what other piece of scripture did Jesus talk about legalism? Well, well, well. Matthew 12. Remember the man with the shriveled hand that Jesus healed and the legalism that was thrown at him as they watched and they confronted Christ. So Matthew 12, 9 to 14. Going on from that place, he went into the synagogue and there was a man with a shriveled hand. Looking for a reason to bring charges against Jesus, they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? He said to them, well, if any of you has sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other one. But the Pharisees went out and they plotted how they might kill Jesus. Well, I love how Jesus in his mighty wisdom and his compassionate love asks them a pertinent and a very amazing question. Would you not save your sheep if it fell into a pit on the Sabbath? Then shouldn't a human be of more value? And that resonated with me. And it brought me back to that Jesus Revolution movie when all the hippies showed up with their dirty feet on one side of the, filled one entire side of the church. And there was three people against the pastor because he allowed them in. And they said, their dirty feet are gonna ruin our carpet. And he said, oh, save the carpet. And so they couldn't handle it. And so he said to them, the front door goes both ways. You can enter it or you can exit it. And so those three people left. But that church grew and grew and grew. And those young people got saved. I remember 
before my mother passed away to glory, she and I were talking alone and she lived as she lived out the rest of her lives in her living room overlooking her beautiful <coughs> garden and her hospital bed. And I believe she had a great deal of time to think about her life and her faith. And she said to me on one of those days, I only wish I could change so many things. And one of them, she said, would have been to remove the legalism that I had put you all under from the church. I remember those days. I wasn't allowed to skateboard on Sunday. Couldn't play cards in the house. No loud music on Sunday. Very little fun on Sunday. And I really think that when we all get to glory, there's going to be so much fun. There's going to be so much beautiful music, so much laughter. After all, we serve a creating, creative, loving God. He wants our faith to shine, to be creative, not sour and dour, not solemn and cruel. To be fair, this person goes on to say, their former denomination has learned a few things since the 60s. Although still governed by ultra-conservative beliefs, they've opened their minds to a few concessions. And their list of sins has changed. In fact, the use of film and video is encouraged during worship. The youth group often goes to movies as a way of building relationships. So they go on to ask, how can we all avoid this trap of legalism and the resulting spiritual abuse that's produced from it? How can church leaders follow the example of Christ when faced with denominational questions. Well, number one, they say, look at the motivation behind the rules. Jesus was more concerned with healing that man than with obeying those rules. His motivation came from compassion and love rather than slavery to the traditions of the Torah. A quick scan of social media reveals condemnation and vitriol by so-called believers, we just look on Facebook, look on YouTube, hoping to convince the world in cyberspace to agree with their politics. Legalism demands agreement, no compassion for other viewpoints, rather an embarrassing deletion of Christian love. Number two, we have to underscore relationship instead of religion. Various denominations include a statement of faith on websites and require new members to follow all their creeds. Yet blanket conformity results in wooden puppets who may know multiple Bible verses, yet lack compassion for the tattooed visitor in the next pew. Very true. Are we truly known by our love and how do we show it? Keep it simple, number three. Learning a list of rules is why they're important. It's not how we live abundant life or that abundant life. Jesus focused in and merged the entire Torah into two commandments. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. The operative verb in these two commandments is love. Rules lack emotion. Yet as we love God and we love others, we reflect who Jesus was and how much he wants to hold us oh so very close to him. To bring this issue into contemporary venue, let's consider again the Sabbath question. Several people that we might know refuse to eat out on Sundays in their view. And I remember this not that long ago. In their viewpoint, if we eat out, then we're forcing someone else to work on the Sabbath. However, since Sundays usually bring in larger crowds, that single mom who works as a waitress depends on, the, on those Sunday tips to feed her children during the next week. By refusing to be that customer, we're shortchanging what she needs to survive. Would we not reflect more of the love of Christ by sharing a meal with others after Sunday service and then giving a hefty tip to the, wait, tip to the waitress and then encouraging her or him with kind words? This person goes on to say that their faith has changed through the years and that they've experienced more joy in the abundant life by avoiding legalistic rules. 
instead trying to build relationships. In fact, they recently enjoyed attending a movie in the dark theater, and one of their friends just lost their husband. And this was her first attempt to go out by herself to watch a movie, but she needed support. So this person joined her and they ate supper together, shared a few hugs, enjoyed the evening without worrying about denominational standards of legalism. Father Rupertus, I can't know if I get his name right. Father Rupertus Maldinius would summarize it, summarize it this way. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, clar- charity. Let's do that again. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. So I read all this. I love reading these stories that other Christians write, pastors and theologians. And I look over my own life. Wow. When I was a young Christian, I imagined that I must have scared a lot of people away with my ferocious faith. I was stuck in that dirty trap of legalism. And then eventually it hit me. Legalism kills. Legalism kills friendships, can kill our witness. It can kill churches. We have to do it this way. It's always been done that way could be carved on the pulpit and pews of all the churches that are dying. Don't we want to be a church that moves ahead with God? I know myself, I don't want to be like a Pharisee. Although I do believe for many years, I probably more identified with them than I did with Jesus. I thought I was interpreting what Christ was teaching me. But now that I feel so much more at ease, now that I know it's through the grace of God and not my own doing, I'm freed from that bondage of legalism. I see that I was not walking in his steps, but trudging through my own steps over and over and over. Not knowing this caused me to dig a deeper pit for myself that only Jesus could reach down and pull me out of. And so I'm so thankful for that real heart change. You've heard me so many times say that I am not the same man that I used to be. And I'm glad that Jesus opened up my eyes and my heart. Then I found this little excerpt by Eric Kleinheiser about legalism in the church. He says the root meaning of the word Pharisee is uncertain, but most likely related to a Hebrew word with the root meaning to separate or detach. And from whom did the Pharisees separate? They separated from other priests who interpreted the law differently than they did. They separated from the Gentiles or the Jews who embraced Hellenistic culture instead of what they were teaching and from certain political groups. The Pharisees tried to avoid these groups of people to separate themselves from any type of impurity prescribed by the Levitical law or more specifically, their strict interpretation of it. Jesus gathers the people together and turns his attention away from them, saying that it isn't things that go in us that defile us, but rather what comes out of us that truly defiles us. He was saying this with the understanding that he was initiating the new covenant. We read it, I read it before, or while we're doing communion, anticipating a time to come when that the old covenant would be swept away by the new covenant. The time was soon coming when believers would no longer live under the letter of the law, but rather by the Holy Spirit. This new covenant life was initiated on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. And it was therefore inevitable that the church would later receive this understanding more thoroughly by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. We find that in Acts chapter 10. So we are called to live in freedom, in the newness of the life in Christ. Romans 8, 1 to 3. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free 
from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. And then Matthew 7, 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Real words, that's from Christ. I think that the bonds of legalism can be broken through a right relationship with Christ. It doesn't mean that we have a license to sin. I'm not saying that. Or that sin is necessarily overlooked. Not at all. But I do think we need to learn to tarry with one another just a little bit more gently. Amen. We'll finish with our closing hymn before the benediction. God bless you today.